I would like to talk about London uh, and, and in a way profess my deep love and, and affection uh, for the city in, in great detail. Um, I first came here, uh, as, as said, in 1988, uh, when Margaret Thatcher was, I think, in power for the last uh, two years. Uh, worked on Docklands, on buildings Harbour Exchange 1, 2, 3, 5, 6 and 7. Um, I uh, revised drawings of reflected ceiling plans for a part of the building that had to be converted into shops uh, from, from being offices while the top floors of that building were still being erected. Because financial analysis has shown that the square meter revenue uh, on, on, uh, for, for the retail program was higher than offices, hence in a way the shopping program fell into the office program while it was still in process. And that was a completely novel uh, experience. It was also a very, very good early warning uh, for some of the things I would uh, experience as a bit more mature architect um, you know, almost two decades uh, later. Uh, and in a way prepared me for a context uh, where, where architects can essentially uh, suffer quite a rude awakening uh, of, of what a footnote uh, they are in the larger process, which I think overall is actually a healthy uh, thing. Um, as said, I, I, I would like to talk uh, about London. This was the second uh, encounter with the city in, in 2005. Um, we took part in a competition uh, for uh, what was then called uh, White City, a great western Canary Wharf, very ironic uh, after having worked on the eastern Canary Wharf uh, 15 years earlier, um, announced by, uh, by, by the mayor, announced with, with a lot of uh, fuss there in the press. And actually, um, that development on the west of London uh, was supposed to take off and in a way complete a kind of series of peripheral uh, developments which now uh, uh, encircle London, a kind of missing link in the chain uh, on, on, the west of, uh, on the west of London. Uh, very interestingly enough, uh, also the site uh, of, of the London Olympics uh, almost uh, a century ago, whereas that is happening again uh, currently uh, in, in the East. Um, a 43-acre site uh, in, in the area which is called the Postal Code, uh, West 12, uh, a little bit uh, bigger than King's Cross, a little bit smaller than Stratford, so in a way in line uh, with the other uh, kind of developments that are happening uh, around the city. Um, a site at the border, exactly at the border of Hammersmith and Fulham and, and Kensington and, and, and Chelsea. Uh, one of the poorest boroughs, I think, uh, bordering one of the richest boroughs. Very interestingly enough, uh, a kind of uh, large, uh, underutilized uh, site with a strangely industrial use considering its meanwhile uh, central location in the city. Um, also a site in... Uh, also a site strangely enveloped by... Uh, by, by infrastructure, uh, therefore in theory very accessible, very reachable, but that very same infrastructure also cuts it off from its surroundings. So a very weird kind of uh, enclave uh, in the city at that point. The site, this is on our first visit, turns out to be an impressive collection of, of dead ends, um, as you can see here. But at the same time it's very, as I said, strategically connected. It's on the central line, it's on the uh, Hammersmith and City line, the West Cross Route passes it, the, the A40 passes it on the north, it's, it's along Wood Lane uh, where the important BBC premises uh, are being located and, and uh, this is an old picture from then. Meanwhile, a big uh, shopping developer by the name of Westfield has taken advantage uh, of all of those conditions, uh, leaving uh, actually a small reservoir of traffic capacity for the urban development in the north. Um, Ken Livingston, it started with uh, an opportunity area uh, framework launched on the 4th of April uh, 2005. Uh, a vision statement, as, as there are many uh, vision statements, 
uh, by the end of the White City opportunity would have been transformed to do a thriving new mixed use urban quarter, the highest quality, strong sense of place, identified a local community, blah, 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 blah. Um, idealist language, but almost generic language <coughs> at the same time. Uh, this was a statement made uh, almost seven years uh, ago. January 2005, we commenced our work after having won a competition. Uh, by the end of that year, we had completed uh, an initial version uh, of the master plan. Three clusters sort of responding to the surroundings on that linear site separated by, uh, by two parks. Um, and, and essentially, after having done that, we, uh, we were very happy. Uh, a local election ensued in May 2006. Uh, Hammersmith of Fulham, formerly uh, a Labour stronghold, turned Conservative for the first time in a very, very uh, long time. Um, we had to meet the Conservatives shortly after they were uh, elected. Uh, presented to them for about half an hour, the remark was, uh, do you really think you can come over here uh, and assume we will all eventually turn around to your European ways. No, sir, thank you very much. <laughs> this was the imagery which had accompanied the plan uh, up until that uh, moment. Uh, a very schematic kind of massing, uh, because it's abstract, I suppose it's also modern. Uh, the main thing is that the frame of reference of the local council was a very, very different frame uh, of reference. Uh, more a kind of uh, resilient London uh, vernacular. So that, 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 that needed to lead to certain action. So what we did was that things uh, which had, had formerly uh, been called blocks, uh, patio dwellings, uh, etc., were, were kind of, first of all, renamed into mansion houses, crescents, and so <laughs> uh, The urban master plan from, from kind of portraying building envelope gave suggesting, uh, suggested masses that actually suggest that within those uh, envelopes quite safely those more traditional London typologies could be realized. And the interesting thing was, after having done this, the plan actually survived the political change intact. I mean, apart from a makeover in style, which is not the essence of a master plan anyway, because different architects will be building it, but apart from a makeover in style, the master plan essentially didn't change at all. Um, there was another factor here, uh, another quote, uh, the substantial financial risk of all by blah, 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 blah. the White City Partnership who joined forces to realize all the benefits of their combined <coughs> business and development capability. The White City Partnership was our client. It was actually a conglomerate of six private parties who collectively uh, uh, owned the land uh, in a kind of Balkan-like uh, situation, uh, a, a, a tapestry of, of small little pieces, partly owned by the BBC, Marks and Spencer's uh, Morley Pension Fund, another stretch of the BBC. Uh, they're almost like the Palestinian territory is carved up on the West, uh, West Bank. A very complicated situation, but a complicated situation which for a long time uh, we could actually ignore, uh, which, which was very good, and we could treat it since those parties had come together, which was one of the conditions uh, laid down by the GLA in order to, uh, in order to support development, uh, act as one entity, so we could actually make uh, one plan. That didn't last. Uh, essentially, uh, one of the first things that happened is that uh, the most southern owner, actually after the erection of the shopping center, uh, saw a very, very profitable deal of actually uh, selling its land to the shopping center for future uh, extension. So that in a way was an abortion where three clusters became two. The whole concept of two parks separating three things uh, roughly went out of the window because it became entirely unpredictable as to what would actually happen uh, on that site. Um, that wasn't good, but simultaneously another current event uh, took place. The BBC uh, was on, in a state of having to axe a lot of jobs, uh, of facing uh, severe budget cuts, which actually made the BBC 
uh, look at their land, at their land holdings, uh, which you see here with a greater degree of interest, that they, uh, in order to compensate for uh, a, a reduced subsidy from the government, actually look for a way to capitalize on their land holdings as, as part of that master plan. So uh, they uh, became a more active uh, partner in the whole thing, uh, actually started to think about how this whole area could be marketed, how their presence could actually attract a range of other media companies, a range of startups, a range of, uh, of creative businesses. The whole uh, exercise was rebranded uh, Creative London. Uh, and, and so these, these bits were now added. Uh, BBC was so confident that once that strategy would be launched, uh, the southern neighbor who had sold his land would reconsider and join the party, and potentially the shopping center would join the party as well. We went ahead, made a master plan. Uh, we had a bigger side to plan than to begin with. Uh, but at the same time, the real status of it uh, was less clear. I mean, was it still an urban plan that was going in for planning permission? Or had we actually become complicit with our urbanism in a large marketing exercise? And in a situation where more and more urban developments actually rely on the market to eventually fill those developments, where each urban plan, in a way, is condemned to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Prophecy. So in a way, each urban plan is in a way an urban plan, but at the same time a marketing exercise to, to eventually make itself happen. Uh, so, having said that, uh, part uh, of the urban plan was also a, a, revis a revisiting of the BBC television centre, not uh, listed at the time, so we had to devise a plan uh, in, in great hurry, not listed. When compared with the best post-war British architecture period, BBC TV does not seem to be a particularly good example of modern architecture from this time. One wonders why, but anyway, uh, uh, these judgments happen. So, uh, in great hurry, uh, we actually redesigned the outer ring, kept the inner ring, and, and made a new plan that paid respect to its form. Uh, but also added a lot of new development uh, on that site. Uh, since we were now working on both sides uh, of Wood Lane, since the BBC territories were incorporated, we could imagine uh, a more vibrant future uh, for Wood Lane uh, and, and, and a more vibrant future for the area altogether. Uh, so this was at the height uh, of the optimism about the whole plan. Uh, since there was optimism, there was also confidence on our side. Uh, therefore, I uh, have the confidence to speak to the press. Uh, when you do a marketing exercise, uh, speaking to the press or, or, or using communication channels is very important. So this happened. BD speaks to Elmer partner René Le Grand, explained the development. The whole thing gained momentum. Actually, much to the dismay of actually some other parties uh, uh, some more conservative parties <coughs> that were party to the whole development that actually uh, didn't think this was a very profitable uh, and good profiling of the area uh, at all. Dear Anir, you will not be surprised to hear that the landowners were extremely displeased by your unilateral decision to talk to the media about our proposal of White City. You control PR very carefully and I appreciate your going going forward. Uh, 400 that we will not disclose any of the White City outside of landowners who speak with from us in the past. Best regard, Matthew Bonning Snook. <laughs> What's in the name? Um, from then on, we communicated, but we communicated in the form that, in a way, Japanese porn uh, <laughs> to cover the sexual act. Uh, but we went on. September 2007. Uh, that's the master plan intact with the BBC property uh, incorporated. Uh, the optimism about the southern neighbour proved unjustified. Uh, BBC, whilst professing a strategy of integral development of the whole thing, sold off the most northern uh, part, so that bit went as well. Television Centre, contrary to earlier verdicts on its validity, was listed by English Heritage, and that put a spoke in the wheel of that thing. So, then we have a smaller area to plan. The most northern part uh, is, is BBM Media Village, uh, which is actually a fairly recent uh, development, so recent, in fact, that an overhaul would be premature, so that went as well. Um, this was a crisis. I mean, in, in, in essence, it meant that the whole Creative London concept had to be carried out on such a small uh, 
territory that the name itself became a bit of a mockery. Um, in that moment of crisis, uh, there was uh, organized what was called a visioning day, uh, chaired by a retired talk show host of the BBC in the Black Flora Deck, uh, whose main sentence was, say it to them, say it to them. <laughs> um, here we have the visionary. <laughs> Uh, and here, uh, part of that process was that, that one in a creative session doesn't take minutes, but there were kind of artists from the borough who kept track of the temperature of discussion by, by actually uh, noting their impressions on the board. Enthusiasm, uh, uh, development, uh, etc. Uh, what are the areas of disagreement, etc., uh, etc. Et um, Things didn't help. Uh, the stretch you see there is actually a revamping of the underground White City Station and actually a development proposed over the uh, subway tracks to the east of the site. Of course, that type of development requires a lot of pre-investment in terms of infrastructure before the return uh, on investment in terms of real estate can materialize. Even though we added a lot of extra program to the station, but it was deemed too risky. So we were then left essentially with a landlocked development uh, and only one central cluster <coughs> bordered by two parks, which essentially also meant the disappearance uh, of that stretch of White City is that in a way this image went back to that image. Uh, eventually, this also didn't happen. <laughs> so, we are dealing with a situation where the only thing that has changed is the date. <laughs> Uh, October 2004, October 2008, and I'm presenting all of this uh, without any, any bitterness. It is simply an account, like there are so many, uh, I, I think 75% to 80% of everything we conceive uh, never sees uh, realization, but that in itself uh, is maybe not necessarily uh, an issue. All of these exercises somewhere end up uh, somewhere. Um, London has a new mayor in the meantime. That mayor, just like his predecessor in 2004, launched an opportunity area framework uh, to develop the site and, 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 and happily invited us to, uh, to participate uh, in it by submitting our previous plans as, as input. The opportunity area frame, the, the coin was White City, uh, World City. So in a way, the same document that had been our brief uh, was the was the end result of our, our work. Uh, White City, World City, that's the cover uh, of that document. Um, I essentially would like to speak about that notion and, and, and this uh, particular experience has also uh, made me think a, a few things about, uh, about London. Uh, This is a slide that should have a different background. Anyway, on this slide was the major rankings of the Economist, uh, Financial Times, uh, and Monocle magazine uh, of, uh, of how London ranks in terms of livable cities. Uh, London doesn't feature on any of these lists, <laughs> which I think is a good thing, uh, because these lists are, are headed by <coughs> Melbourne, uh, Wellington, uh, uh, Vancouver, etc., etc. I mean, really places so sterile, so Anglo that you really wonder whether as long you would want to be a part of it. Uh, I think there is something very, very interesting uh, about that element of London, that blasé element of London. If you look at London, you see that it in a way has the wonderful ability to make many people equal in the sense that the type of inefficiency and slowness that we were subjected to in White City, that you are subjected to at five o'clock in traffic, indiscriminately hits everyone. And it also means to the many celebrities that London has brought forward, actually London is a home and not a stage, which is a very interesting notion. So a few examples. A young, uh, a young Mick Jagger here in the street, the Sex Pistols in a container, their inventor, uh, Marco McLaren in London, David Bowie, posing in, in London, I don't know who this is. Uh, a very interesting notion where actually creativity, uh, glamour, image, 
actually weirdly coincide with reality. So Vivian Westwood, Vivian Westwood uh, on a bike. The mayor on a bike. Uh, on the phone, no, not on the phone. Uh, Ricky Gervais, uh, George Michael. I mean, very unflattering uh, images. And London is distinctly unflattering, and it's almost a key point. Pete between alcohol, somewhere between alcohol and coffee. Pete Doherty and Kate Moss by the time of stage of coffee. No comment. Um, and this, this, this element, uh, I guess it's a very English element, I guess it's a very London uh, element. At the same time, the pride one takes in tradition, which somehow is so deeply rooted that the mockery of tradition uh, can go equally far. A city which inspires such confidence that it doesn't feel the need to compete on rankings. A city which inspires so much confidence that in a way it, it, can, it can have an image and at the same time be completely oblivious uh, to its own image. Um, this is the English flags. London swings again. English flag is a background to two people. The Union Jack. The Union Jack in a different capacity. God save the Queen. Uh, sex Pistols. The Union Jack in another capacity in a more vulgar uh, area. Indiscriminately uh, the background of so many facets uh, of English life uh, without ever fundamentally uh, being questioned. We once designed a new flag uh, for the European Union uh, which accidentally got published in The Independent. Um, <coughs> What that inspired, and, and, and wrongly the Independent said that the flag had been approved, but it, in England that sp inspired a spontaneous uh, adherence campaign for the old European flag, the stars on the blue thing, which has been the symbol of everything but the love to hate, but simply the new, uh, almost by definition, inspires a loyalty to the old. And this is, I think, the function uh, of the new, if anything. Uh, anyway. What is <laughs> what it also, I mean, what the point also, I, I think, uh, of the slides is that, that London is very creative. It's very creative about its own tradition. It's a place of huge creativity. It doesn't need developments called Creative London to be creative or to make it creative. The whole point is London is creative which I think accounts why an exercise like White City didn't really go anywhere, because it didn't really have to go uh, anywhere. It's creative in, in, in very, very many fields, very, very many fields. However, there is one domain where it is not creative. That domain is architecture. I mean, architecture <laughs> and urbanism here are subject to surely the most bizarre debate that I have ever experienced in, in any of the countries uh, I've worked in. This is Prince Charles. Pater Noster Square, a uh, kind of huge, lengthy uh, debate uh, about a development that doesn't really merit uh, any publicity. Uh, of course, the other debate is, is Chelsea Barracks, uh, the, the Richard Rogers proposal for it, uh, then Richard Rogers getting a royal barracking, risking a clash between the monarchies, Roth and Rogers, and Charles put scorn on plans, uh, has his own alternative. <laughs> And here again, modernity inspires uh, a kind of revived traditionalism. And of course, Lord Rogers' attacks strikes right back uh, at the prince. Um, I've always wondered about this debate. And, and for me, this debate isn't really a debate between modernity uh, and classicism. I, I think if I'm really, really honest, uh, I, I don't know whether this is Leon Greer. Uh, or, or Rob Creer or whoever, it probably is. But my point is that the proposal of Rogers for Chelsea Barracks is simply as mediocre as this proposal. So that in a way, a lot of modernity brings it on itself. And the whole thing is that the debate isn't a, a debate between modernity and traditionalism. The debate is actually a debate between two types of the same establishment, between two types of establishment who need kind of these events to simply stay uh, an establishment. And, and in that sense, architecture uh, is, is, is a pretext more than, than, than a result in, in a largely rhetoric culture, in largely a culture of, of prevailing establishments. Uh, this, I think, proves the point. Um, Okay, uh, I will skip this. 
this was uh, the, the, the story here uh, was actually a story about the double decker bus, which had already been replaced uh, by uh, simply a single decker long bus and <coughs> an attempt to revive it. And a poll amongst Londoners that, uh, that they couldn't care less, but anyway. Um, <laughs> left over slides. Uh, Piccadilly Circus, 1920. Piccadilly Circus, 1960. Piccadilly Circus, late 60s. Piccadilly Circus, uh, 2010. The interesting thing uh, is that, in a way, the thing that changes most radically is the technique of photography rather than the <laughs> physical place uh, itself. And, and, and the ability to stay the same is actually a remarkable uh, modern ability, uh, in my view, but more about that later here, but at Trafalgar Square. Trafalgar Square today the same, uh, applies. Uh, Whitechapel, Whitechapel uh, today, uh, the same uh, applies. In a way, uh, a substance that's never been formally modernized, a substance that essentially stays the same for a longer period of time, but at the same time a substance that undergoes huge change. Areas uh, become gentrified, down, areas of change of use, etc. The way uh, the substance is being used actually changes quite drastically without the substance changing itself. And that says something about the inherent creativity uh, in a way to come to terms with that substance and to, to use it in a, in a different way. London's modernity, and particularly the best examples of London modernity, uh, are not uh, categorical overhauls of the city for the most part. They are very discrete insertions in a largely traditional uh, fabric. In that sense, the interesting thing about them is, is that yes, they are modern buildings, uh, but they're insertions in a status quo. They derive much of that quality from themselves, but they also derive much of that quality from being different uh, than their environment. And as such, they oppose this environment, but at the same time they have a very vested interest in the status quo of the environment because that is how they remain <coughs> different, which is again a very, very interesting paradox. Um, one doesn't really know what to do with this period. Uh, I showed it in the case of Television Center earlier. This one is preserved. This one is now preserved. This one is not. I have no explanation for it. There seems to be a statistical law that one in every three uh, <laughs> a lot of goes. Uh, but a verdict apparently seems uh, different. Um, a strategic insertion. This, this is uh, the building that preceded uh, our uh, building for the Rothschilds uh, Bank, which was also a modern building, also a very discreet, beautiful insertion, almost hidden uh, from the main street. And, and London's modernity, in a way, uh, really only becomes visible once you rise up in these buildings, once you enter on the roofs, and that's actually when the sum total of these accumulated incidents starts to acquire a modern city. But at the same time, when you're in the street, uh, like in, in this case here, you're almost protected from the onslaught of modernity while it still happens, uh, almost by stealth. This was the case uh, until very recently. I think the, the problem uh, London has with master plans is that by definition, they are not insertions. Master plans imply a kind of coherence on their own, have to profess an ambition about the city, whereas a building can limit its profession to, to being a profession about a building, and therefore also fall into the trap of entering a type of rhetoric that I don't think is really English. Uh, a few examples, this is King's Cross, Olympics. Uh, and of course an early example of, of Canary Wharf uh, with its buildings. And here also you see that even in the buildings there is a, a remarkable sameness where one building tries to sort of relate to the next modern building and a kind of generic blandness that, uh, that emerges. One of the most disastrous uh, things that I think has happened in recent year is, is in a way the emphasis on public space, the rediscovery of public space as a term which in a way is more a hint of how much of a problem it has become than that it's actually an ideology. Uh, this is how we think our cities uh, should be boulevard, road, square, yard, park. Uh, this is the sketches that are produced uh, in a way to, 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 to delineate that ambition. 
this is a recent development near Arsenal. This is a rendering. That's the reality. This is a rendering uh, full of people. The reality is empty. It's a rendering full of people. The reality is empty. Uh, our public space, <laughs> however it's designed in the modern world, is, is largely a space of evacuation. Um, new urbanism is, is in a way the, the, the father <coughs> of many of these rediscoveries and many of these fictions which are projected on the city. Uh, here, uh, an Amer American example, Seaside Celebration, uh, Seaside Florida, uh, home of the Truman Show, essentially a controlled environment inspiring uh, a controlled life, as, uh, as, as in the case of with, with Jim Carrey. And I don't know, but this guy to me doesn't look like for the next 24 hours he's going to have anything unpredicted and, and, and he's not going to have any fun. If I look at this guy uh, in New York world, I, I don't know what he's up to, but I have a hunch that for the next 24 hours he's going to have a very, very enjoyable time. <laughs> Drunks uh, were once an integral part of our city. Once there was a time when our cities were not sanitized, when we didn't feel the need to sanitize them, where somehow uh, the fabric of the city could incorporate a fact of life that would always be there. Uh, Potsdamer Platz, uh, the way it was at the turn of the last century, uh, Potsdamer Platz uh, basically has been redesigned uh, as public space, which is a euphemism for largely commercial space. The environment is full, but completely sterile, and the environment is also an environment of control. It's an environment that's being watched. I mean, this is a CCTV camera uh, in Oxford Street, where increasingly public space is monitored and, and controlled. And even if there's a camera, one wonders, with this the first step of an elimination of anonymity, how public a space then really is. Uh, you are being watched. Uh, on that note, uh, there is an interesting uh, sidetrack uh, to be made. This is uh, more recent. This is the riots and the looting last year. Uh, the looting last year. Pioneer. One wonders if it was really riots or whether it was a sort of proletarian shopping uh, <laughs> event. <laughs> um, but anyway. What for me is interesting about this is that uh, in the same way as public space is misunderstood and wrong, that I think also, and I'm not saying these riots were a good thing for the city, but I think what is also particularly shocking uh, and, 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 and mysterious is that, that also the riots have expired a whole series of explanations why they happened that in my view completely missed the point. But this is the first kind of normative uh, slashing. Uh, but it goes in every direction. It goes to all sides of the political spectrum. Uh, the economic stagnation and its cuts being imposed by the Tory government inevitably creates social division. That is Labour using the riots to reinforce its point and its mission. It's the Daily Telegraph. So that can be only one respondent in the respect of sort of reaching the respect for the law in the hard way. That's the right end of the political spectrum, using the same event simply as an embellishment of their program. And again, uh, the events simply propel the two establishments to be more the same than they already were. Again, uh, a shocking, turbulent upheaval in the city somehow has a backlash in the fact that establishments somehow see it as a reason to reinforce themselves. Uh, I think the point of the I don't know what the points of the riot was, but the riots were bizarre, uh, that's for sure, and, and so bizarre that in a way any, I don't know what the explanation is, but I do know that in a way either of these explanations completely miss the point. This is one of the rioters on Facebook, uh, happily, sort of proudly, letting his loot. Uh, of course, uh, the whole supposed underclass uh, that was identified in a way went out of the window when, when Chelsea Ives uh, was reported by, uh, by her mother. I think that's another interesting twist uh, you know, on the lack of opportunity that, that accounts uh, as a reason, etc., etc. Uh, another, uh, <coughs> uh, another mysterious spotting. <laughs> another mysterious uh, spotting. <laughs> number of other mysterious uh, <laughs> spotting. Raymond, the political sphere allegedly participated. <laughs> <laughs> By, uh, um, I, I'd like to circle back to, to public space because, I mean, this is one of the most 
crude uh, examples, I think, of, of an account about the riots. It's, it's sort of an example, it's, it's a right-wing example, but I mean also showed that there were left-wing examples here, who proposes to bring the rioters before the courts, which I guess something is to be said, but then also recommends the court immediately what sentence to pass, which I guess in, in, uh, in, in a trias politica is, is, is a somewhat awkward thing uh, to do. Um, but as said, uh, normatism and this kind of normatism that in a way misses the true essence of this city and the true essence of its substance, which is in a, in a way an incorporative, uh, bland, indifferent essence and therefore a wonderful essence to incorporate whatever fact uh, of life, stretches actually in, in bizarre directions. Uh, this is something uh, that we came across a few years ago when we were looking at the Cape uh, material when we had a speaking engagement there. Uh, uh, the park force, a force for the good. Uh, the park force, uh, in a way, deals with uh, litter in the park and maintains the park uh, very, very clearly. <coughs> because very, very fast, far that it in a way uh, points out the relevance of rubbish bins. Uh, and, and the park force is actually a, a kind of benign fascist hippie force that actually uh, <laughs> applies that kind of same sanitization. I mean, essentially uh, an originally rebellious movement, I guess, now part of an establishment that also propels the same kind of sanitization of public space as many of the other forces propel. So in that sense, it's a kind of very weird full circle. I'd like to end on, uh, on the same uh, 60s image, late 60s image of Piccadilly that I showed earlier, which is for me an appealing image, and which is for me an image that encapsulates uh, <coughs> London very well in the sense that it's a city which hasn't edited itself, a city which is, you know, all encompassing. And if one were to apply today's uh, judgments and today's uh, normative uh, verdicts that are passed, uh, essentially many of the elements that you see here uh, would not comply with what we think is right. The bus is not carbon neutral, no religion in public space, not iconic, congestion to be pedestrianized, uh, actually it's height limit, not approved by national heritage, etc., etc., etc. Et 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 and in a bizarre way, <laughs> That kind of uh, sanitization and that kind of normatism also spells the death of the true vibrancy that in a way is London. Uh, based on the Asian patterns and agreements, it's admitted to the triumph of improvisation over foresight, current of the, the definitive taboo of the Grand uh, Projet. And I think that is uh, what to me it really is. I mean, an essentially amorphous, uh, all-assuming uh, urban fabric which also simply absorbs modernism, allows modernism, tolerates modernism, allows it to happen, and wonderfully makes it irrelevant, or wonderfully makes it the same footnote as it makes a lot of, uh, of other things. So, um, well, those are my thoughts, and, and that's my talk. Thank you. Rainier, thank you for that. You've given us a, a, a rich layer cake. Can I kick things off by asking to what extent you've reached those thoughts and conclusions about what London really is before you started on your White City Master Plan, or to what extent did that experience kind of focus um, and, and concentrate your view about um, the kind of historical accidents or difficulties or impossibilities of doing certain things in the city? Um, I think many of the thoughts were there as hunches. Hunches which I was never quite able to put into words. Well, maybe I still am. Uh, but I'm never quite able to put in, in words. But it certainly accelerated an understanding. And it also certainly accelerated uh, an attitude where uh, you really became realistically realistic about the limitations of what architecture does in this city, but also what architecture actually means in general. So it's 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 sometimes very difficult as a as as somebody uh, 
practices in architecture to deal with it, but at the same time I do think it's a kind of healthy relativity which, which would probably do a lot of architects a lot of good. Because I suppose the idea that, oh well, Britain uh, in general and London in particular doesn't like big plans, um, haven't had an effective one since the Romans, Wren never got anywhere with his, um, the history of successful planning at big scale by and large, unless it's underground, uh, has been carried out by owners. And I was very struck, I mean single owners, so the landed estates could invent, um, you know, Cuba could invent uh, Belgravia and uh, the, the, the Bedford estate could invent what it, what it invented. Very difficult to do when you have split ownerships of the sort that you had at White City. Um, and I wonder whether um, experience of the practice in other cities, um, particularly in the Netherlands actually, is there such a contrast there? Is there more land assembly? Is there less, um, less sort of uh, uh, splinter-like in its ownerships? Not necessarily. It depends where you, uh, where, where you uh, work. Because I, I guess in, in, in Amsterdam and Rotterdam, in the big cities, it's fairly similar. But there are more rules. So you have a greater chance of being able to predict what will actually fly and what will not. Because, I mean, I think here, particularly <coughs> after the, the Thatcher days, the initiative has shifted from the public sector to the private sector to such an extent uh, that the public sector almost in, in an extreme sense limits its roles to words, to planning documents, and, and not envelopes, not drawings, not even zoning, and in a way limits its role to at the end of the day doing that or doing that. And in the and before it does that or that, it just keeps everyone guessing. And, and it hopes that by keeping people guessing, uh, for as long as possible, actually the private sector will impose good behavior on itself to simply avoid uh, the risk. And, and that's simply because they don't say in advance, when you do this and this and this, you'll be all right. Uh, and when you do that, they will never allow it. They say, hmm. interesting. Uh, and that sort of thing uh, simply takes longer because it's like a chess game and at a certain moment you have an end game and then people put their cards on the table. And, and so it's not, the private situation is not necessarily different in Holland and Germany. There is just more zoning and, and activity from the public sector which makes it more pre predictable. It's quite curious in a way that um, a, a planning culture, um, which as a profession um, mostly was focused on London in the early decades of the 20th century, um, which saw planning and architecture as pretty much um, a synthetic whole sort of Abercrombie plan, really makes no distinction between land use, uh, aesthetics, how the city operates, transport, completely kind of seamless, synthesized um, proposition. And yet increasingly, um, in recent decades, planning seems to have become um, an aesthetics-free an ideas free zone. It's more like a, the occasion to have a conversation um, than to actually engage with something with any degree of certainty, as you're saying. But I would guess that in some ways that actually creates quite an attractive canvas. If, I mean, especially for OMA, I mean, you, you are conversational. Uh, if, if, anything, if anything potentially is possible, there aren't any limits. You can't say for certain whether we would approve a thousand foot tower at London Bridge or not, or whether we'd actually spend nine billion pounds on um, an Olympic legacy or not, um, based on a master plan for the entirely commercial development which preceded our Olympic bid, etc., etc. Presumably there are some attractions for the, the slightly um, uh, Wild West approach. Yeah, it's, it's hugely tempting. Uh, particularly at the beginning, because I mean, uh, when nothing is stated clearly to you, one or at least we presume anything goes. You know, so it's it's uh, it's a very very uh, interesting situation where you you almost uh, we work 
in Russia at the moment, so forgive the uh, analogy. It's almost like a kind of Operation Barbarossa, uh, where, uh, you know what that is, yeah, uh, where in the first uh, 16 hours, you conquer uh, an incredible amount of territory and, and you think you are therefore close to victory. You start celebrating your victory uh, very happily, only to find out that the Russian winter sets in, in plain terms, uh, and, and, and that uh, actually with the end goal in sight, you get stuck in the mud, and actually the last 12 kilometers take longer than the first 100. And, and in that sense, it's, it's a territory that inspires huge enthusiasm, only to confront you later with a huge demand for stamina. And, and I would say that is a, a curious mix. And one of the one of the elements that designers need stamina. Um, uh, one of the things they need stamina in respect of is the increasing uh, requirements uh, of all sorts of legislative or advisory uh, bodies. And I was very struck by this, in a sense, the way that that city environments and buildings become illegal. Or almost simply through the passage of time, very few existing buildings, by definition, have today's legal standards about insulation. Do you feel that, um, do you particularly feel that in London, that, that somehow um, our attitudes to things, particularly this, as you say, the rise and rise of the notion of public space, is more intense uh, than in other places? Every city has buildings that, by today's standards, are illegal. Yeah, well, so does London. Mm. Uh, since, uh, I mean, uh, since it's a negotiative uh, culture, as you said, uh, conversation plays a big part in it. Rhetorics <coughs> also play a big part in it. Uh, but at the same time, since, I mean, there's nothing vaguer than design than architecture, uh, in order to argue for things, uh, you need measurements. Uh, you need, uh, in a way, figures to prove you're right. And in that sense, uh, sustainability is also here very, very much on, on the other. But sustainability is, is, in my view, very often an attempt to make a design exercise measurable. In, I mean, LEED has about 70 performance criteria, but you can tick boxes. And of course, in a culture that needs to answer to the next person, to the next person, and the next, ticking boxing is important, being able to measure things is, is important. And we on, on Commonwealth, I think, while we were working on it, a new law, uh, even called a fact, where buildings have to be even better, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, it's, it's very hard to escape. I mean, it's, it's, it's like complaining about the weather. And do you think the effect on designers is that, um, that increasingly one sees um, especially with not such great clients and more difficult sites, that the temptation is then is merely to design to the restrictions of the limits and the tip boxes and actually what you end up doing, instead of designing what you want to design and then making it conform in a seamless sort of way with all those restrictions and requirements. So what people start off doing is saying, okay, what are the restrictions on this site? And actually the grit in the oyster becomes the only thing that matters. Yeah, I, I, I don't know whether it's that extreme because I don't think the criteria are explicit enough that they can generate buildings uh, on their own. But what you, and we anyway, do what we always do and make it conform somewhere uh, along the way. But I think what you do see uh, is that because uh, when decisions become measurable, you have to answer for your decisions by those measurements. And in that sense, that in competitions, and, and particularly in European tenders, that they do have a tendency to produce more predictable winners and, and less exciting results. Because also one of the criteria is that whatever you apply has it been tested. When it's been tested, it means it's been done before. So in that sense, it's, it's not a particularly good condition for experiment. We, we are sceptical about any sort of activities. It's not we're anti-growth. We're just sceptical about whether anything can be better than what went before. Yeah, but I think you also have a wonderful ability to reinterpret uh, what was there before. And in fact, uh, that ability can be so extreme that it can, in the end, simply make the need for the new redundant. 
because if you're able to permanently uh, reinterpret the existing, uh, the, the existing becomes the new, uh, time and time and time uh, again. And I think there is, maybe that's an extreme statement, but I do think there's some of that. It is the history of constitution monarchy, isn't it? That reinvention or retrofitting it um, has ensured it thus far. Let me bring the audience in. Any, any questions for radio? There's been a lot of ground has been covered. I haven't asked anything um, uh, about the looting, for example. But uh, yes, please uh, do tell us who you are. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, uh, thanks for the talk. It's very, it's very, very great talk. Um, and I'm going to ask kind of the obvious question: How would you get kind of a young Mick Jagger to hang out in your master plans? How would you approach kind of this getting around this kind of sterile master plan from the bird's eye view and creating something interesting and and not just I don't know kind of um, uh, well, it's, it's hard to give a general answer because I'm sure that also our master plan uh, can easily fall victim uh, to the same ails that I've described in the master plans of others. So, I mean, it's by no means, uh, this talk is by no means a way to talk ourselves up as, as architect, but in the case of White City, we deliberately took an approach of clusters uh, so that we could improvise vis-a-vis uh, -vis the context, that we in a way could mimic uh, some of the uh, context in the new topologies we inserted there, but also that these small fragments uh, in a way could improvise vis-a-vis -vis the existing so that we didn't really define uh, an, a, a blanket new internal cohesion between the development as a whole, but to find kind of pockets of coherence which in a way mirrored the immediate surroundings uh, there. That was the attempt. But uh, unfortunately, you know, there's nothing realized to prove that that would have worked and would have been non-sterile. Um, there is a sort of disconnect, isn't there, between um, between fast money and slow money, but in, in large parts of London, if you, if you took city sections, you would find an extraordinary variety of use of rental levels in places that have been master planned or whether there's a, where there's a monoculture going on. I mean, the kind of the, the boringness of the section um, is actually mirrored in the fact that you almost inevitably will find that it's all fast money. So unlike, say, Paris, where the ground plane, small business shops, which is a deliberate part of their, their planning and fiscal systems to make sure um, that actually you don't have to be Prada or Starbucks to be able to afford the rental on a small ground floor. Your house is back to your Harbour Exchange thing in a way, isn't it? Except that was very much the kind of commercial end of it. And it's very, very difficult because of financial structures to um, create um, whole areas or even single buildings uh, with conventional financial systems these days where you can have the messiness of the ground floor and the small independent operator paying low rents allied with high rental, you know, first, first grade office space. I think they're trying it a bit at King's Cross, but I can't say it seems to have been cracked in London thus far. Are there examples where you think where you think it has happened at all? Um, in in terms of new developments, yeah, no, and and, and I think that, I mean, uh, one of the things of 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 working in a development context is that you work for clients who eventually uh, have in their minds. Uh, <coughs> Uh, to, to sell off uh, or, or to rent out to, to prospective third parties whom you don't know. Yeah. So in that sense, uh, they are second guessing the, wi the wishes of an as of yet unidentified eventual occupier, uh, which in a way uh, instigates a certain extreme kind of carefulness as to what will work and what will not work. And of course the ground floor is where you enter a building. The ground floor is also where the ownership boundaries 
uh, etc. Are, are, are defined in such a case. Anyway, the ground floor is also where the content has to become specific for it to do uh, what, what you describe. And I think the fact that we are largely today building for an enormous market, and at the same time that the chunks in this market are, are probably a lot bigger uh, than they were in, in, in bygone days, leads to a kind of monoculture where the monotony of the section simply continues all the way to the ground floor. Yeah. Let's take, the, take another one. Yes, from down here. Hi, Hi Renee. Thanks a lot for a very good thought. I was interested in, um, in what you said about ideologies by default um, in, I guess, British culture. And, um, and it seems like there's a notion of control um, in, in what you were talking about in the sense that the most active force seems to be the media. Um, you present quite a few examples of that. Um, and I think in, in a way you seem to have subverted your own project by going to the media and talking to them. Um, and Victor, your managing director, spoke a couple weeks ago uh, here, and he was mentioning that AMO is becoming is being pushed in practice as, as a more and more important part of your practice. I guess my question is, um, do you foresee AMO becoming more um, important? And would you see an AMO involvement growing in London, for example? Uh, well, <laughs> in the context of this master plan, there was an AMO uh, involvement to the moment the BBC got active. I mean, the moment they defined uh, this creative London, they defined uh, very clearly uh, what the ambitions were of the master plan and what type of people they were trying to uh, attract. Uh, we actually, part of, uh, part of the commission was done by AMO in a way to help them speculate on the type of practices or the type of companies they could uh, target. It's also before the Design Museum, uh, 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 the Commonwealth Institute. Part of that exercise uh, was also to uh, partly to design residential buildings around it, but also to think of a potential future use of that open type of, of building. So that was also an AMO exercise. We investigated the market, looked at the type of space, looked at the type of user, etc., and tried to, in a way, rather than drastically converting the building to a fixed use, in a way almost find a type of, of end user which could take the building as is, uh, you know, in a way take the space and then find a user which would match that space rather than the other way around. So it's, it's already uh, playing a role in the projects as they currently uh, happen. And I, I see, you know, with, uh, with kind of urbanism and marketing, Kind of increasingly engaged in kind of in a Faustian uh, pact, I, I do see that role grow bigger. Also, as a form of resistance against you know the blandness that, that that pervades a lot of marketing. Can I just add one in about that uh, urban design? Because I remember Rem saying very crossly after after I don't know some minor criticism of the building at Porto. And had a real go at urban designers who he describes as a new invented niche profession. He described them as authoritarian scripters. Um, what well, he might have been quite new the, for all I know, but I mean, is, 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 do you think. Was that autobiographical? Or? Uh, well, that's a very good question. But, uh, I, I, I wonder whether um, you think that uh, urban design is essentially a good thing which is in danger of being subverted um, by. Uh, its role in potential marketing, or whether you're actually suspicious about it as an activity independent of architecture planning, all the stuff AMO does. Uh, I'm skeptical about what it has become, uh, because I think uh, it, you know, the, the, the whole evolution of, of urbanism, if you take it since the 50s and the 60s into the present day. Uh, I think has been an increasing claim uh, of thinking that they could control the eventual physical outcome to the last detail uh, at a time when uh, society moves into another direction and actually denied them more and more means to actually control that outcome. I think it's weirdly paradoxical that in the 50s where you know you had public housing 
largely populating urban plans, and they were both done by a council, and you almost knew the type of stones that would eventually you know, uh, populate your master plan. That actually in those times where the potential of that type of control existed, the whole rhetoric about control was a lot less. And that actually in a time where that control is, is impossible, the whole rhetoric of control is so large. And I think it propels a kind of false myth about what urbanism can do, and therefore propels a kind of perpetual disappointment at its results. Thanks. Yeah, please. Yeah, thanks. That's all for you. Um, just thinking about uh, stereotypes, um, it seems that modernism took off not, um, quite well in countries of the post-Reformation, rationalistic countries like so, Germany and the Netherlands. Uh, do you see um, any of these sort of national stereotypes playing into this overly uh, determined and uh, bureaucratic planning process uh, in this country? I, I don't know whether it's overly bureaucratic. I, I think it's uh, actually quite the opposite. Of, uh, the, the slowness is actually the result of, of, of the absence of an efficient bureaucracy. The slowness is, is, is embedded in the inherent fact that, that it's a negotiation and that you need to give a negotiation the time to pan out. Uh, efficiently. I also think that England, up until a certain moment, had very, very interesting modern architecture, very, very radical uh, modern architecture. It's all. Uh, it, it's not that it's it's uh, against the na the nature of the nation to be modern. I think that the, it, it's simply the event of the 80s and and the whole. Re it's in, you don't have proportional representation of government. I mean, you have Labour or Conservatives. I mean, it's changed a little bit, but still. So the landslide, you know, that happened in the 1980s on Callaghan against Thatcher, the whole landslide that happened there has been much deeper and much more radical than it's been on the continent. We also have a neoliberal agenda, which has gradually been pushed. I mean, if we have a right-wing government, uh, it, it gets executed in an accelerated way. If we have a left-wing government, it still gets executed, but it's a little bit slow. But it's an, in, in, an inevitable shift uh, of, a of a confirmation to the market economy, which I think has happened here simply quicker, more radical, uh, and in that sense has had bigger repercussions uh, for, for, modern, uh, for the, the type of earlier modernity, which relied uh, on a strong public sector. Take one more question. Yes, please, sir. Um, you were talking about um, when you work in other countries, such as in, in Holland and in continental countries, where there is a much more predetermined uh, envelope or uh, strategy. It's much clearer from the beginning what is going to be uh, acceptable. It's much more uh, deterministic, if you like. Um, and the system that we have here is, um, as you say, much more negotiation, which is, as an architect, unbelievably frustrating, as you've just shown. Uh, however, it does allow that input from a broader uh, group of people. It does allow a great deal more of actually testing with, uh, um, with the public, and obviously you have that frustrating public consultation and all of that stuff you have to go through, but it is is actually tested more or less through that, that process, that crucible. I'm interested in when you work in countries like Holland or Berlin or whatever, and maybe you're in the process of actually determining what's planned in groups. I don't know if you do that kind of work. Uh, what degree of public consultation is there in setting out those kind of master plans? Is there as much public consultation in determining uh, the kind of planning beliefs that you are given as an architect in the game? Um, first of all, I, I, I am not frustrated. I mean, uh, as I said at the beginning of, yeah, uh, at, at the beginning of, of my talk, it's like I have a deep love for the city. I also have actually a deep love for the way of working because, I mean, we are quite good at a negotiative game. It also you know, uh, <coughs> makes you use certain skills to a greater degree. So it's, 
it, it's not bad at all. There is public consultation, of course, also in the Netherlands. I mean, the Netherlands is as much a respectable democracy as the UK. Um, <laughs> uh, um, so the, the extent is the same, you know, the extent, uh, but also I think that the public consultation there happens in a different uh, format. It happens in a less improvised way. It happens in a more uh, structured way. That at least when there's public opposition, you know it uh, and, and you can act on it. I mean, what can happen here is that two people meet each other in the high street uh, and, and they were supporters yesterday, then they go to lunch. And I mean, it's a culture that, that also thrives on, on being bored very, very quickly. Uh, I mean, I've, in, in, uh, in working here, I've, I've encountered great support and great encouragement, uh, which happened very, very quickly. You know, as an outsider, it's a very, very welcoming uh, team. At the same time, that support can dwindle uh, uh, just as, 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 as quickly. And since also, I think, public consultations uh, an informal dialogue with residents, etc., happen in a much more improvised way. It 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 provokes there's simply less of a cutoff date. It it just uh, simply inspires a being on one's guard for a lot uh, longer because support can emerge, supports can dwindle, and, and it's just the nature. It's it's not that the extent of involvement of the public, or it's not that it's any more democratic or less democratic in one of the countries, it's, it's the way things uh, are done. And it's, it's precisely the thing about bureaucracy, uh, it's, it's, it's to some extent the absence or, or the making redundant of a certain excess bureaucracy that kind of creates its own uh, labyrinth in that way. I suppose I'm just wondering, are people more uh, likely to be involved in the process when it's a real concrete proposal rather than when it's quite an abstract planning proposal, a series of boxes and heights and development planes and so on, which is what you get in some countries like France. Most plans in France you tend to just have very simple forms and they are generated. Uh, and I just wonder whether people are actually very interested or feel very involved in that kind of process versus the English process where you're talking about a real building and the real removal of that tree and making the street right here. But the, I, I think the difference here is, 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 is scale because I mean you have master plans here, you have master plans in Holland, you have buildings here, you have master buildings there and of course a master plan is by definition abstract. A master plan by definition creates building plots and envelopes in which ultimately third parties uh, with their own architect actually end up building. So in order to assess a master plan properly, it requires a completely different eye. It to some extent requires a kind of trained eye uh, to, to see what works and what doesn't work. It's ultimately a more technocratic uh, kind of thing and the involvement of the public there is, is difficult because clearly once you have a building, it's, it's much more tangible and you know anybody has the right to have an opinion about a building, and as you see, is what you get. Whereas with a master plan, it's it's much easier to get it wrong. It's also much easier to fool people, and that's why this this ample diarrhea of professed uh, ambitions in the most PC kind of language is so prevalent uh, in it. It's simply because it's it's the result isn't there, and the result is in a way deferred. So you talk about intentions, you consult the public on intentions, and you don't consult the public on potential imminent results. A good note to end on, I think, because, I mean, actually, I think that kind of draws a couple of strands together. One is um, this question about stamina. Uh, these uh, long projects, and <coughs> actually quite modest buildings in London, concerned quite long projects. Um, without the stamina, you are lost. Um, and there are two, I think, two sorts of stamina. One is the stamina to see a really good idea through, and the other one is simply the stamina to stay in business. Um, and there's an element of both of those in any successful practice. But I think in the examples of the Commonwealth Institute and also um, Rothschild, which are the success stories uh, in this city, 
as opposed to the slightly surreal saga, um, you know, in, including, you know, the shocking revelations of the master plan in building design, which kind of looked like a cut and paste from any city at night, actually. It wasn't giving a huge amount of <laughs> Uh, on, thing away. on the face of it, absolutely. And actually, in a, in a, in a way, the strength of the reaction to nothing being given away um, is a clue that I think those landowners just weren't getting on too well together. There are a lot of things that we didn't pursue, which uh, well, I'm, I'm certainly going to think about uh, on the way home, because your suggestion that actually architectural controversy um, and disputes is often the occasion in Britain anyway, um, for uh, the establishment to reinforce its relationship with what appear to be opposites, but in fact are part of the same, uh, part of the same establishment. And it is, of course, noticeable that all the architects that the Prince of Wales has really had a go at uh, over the years have all been knighted in Oboard um, and, and have got as, almost as much ermine as he has. Um, and that, that, I think, is a very, very interesting thing, as was your observation about the way in which people just did pav the Pavlovian reactions uh, to uh, the looting, which were quite interesting spatially. The more thoughtful analysis that's come out about why did things happen in certain places, and on the face of it, where conditions weren't much different, things didn't happen. And so there's a whole argument there way beyond the immediate um, editorialising <coughs> Um, in which I think n neither Ken nor Boris acquitted themselves with any, any sort of uh, credit whatsoever. Um, it was really kind of, uh, it was rent amount of time. And in a way, um, those examples of extreme in London, nothing happens for years and then suddenly you have this completed, unexpected burst of energy, some of it, um, some of it very unpleasant, some of it just casual um, playing around, it did strike me in some ways a very London thing. And that sort of reaction which was while they were busy letting off MPs for stealing tens of thousands of pounds of expenses money, um, they would contemplate jailing 16 year olds for helping to a bottle of Evian water on the way home, um, was, was part of the kind of surreal uh, notion of what, of what London can be like and what British society can occasionally be like. And the fact that it's all calmed down and quiet, it seem, does seem like another country now, doesn't it? It's only a few months ago. Uh, I suppose my final um, observation is that um, this thing about London being able or not able to do big things, I think is absolutely fascinating because although it's true um, that we haven't had, we haven't had a Red Master Plan and we haven't had a houseman, but what we did get was Bazalgette um, sorting out the water and the sewerage, and in the process, uh, doing it for the organisation, London Metropolitan Board of Works, which becomes actually the London County Council, um, the first truly great municipal organisation uh, in the world. And that great um, sort of evolutionary master plan of the London Underground. And in the way that you've described those bits of the establishment actually being so close to each other in some ways that they're the same thing, it always struck me that the, the big argument between Terry Farron and Richard Rogers, Rogers saying you had to have a big plan, Terry Farron said you shouldn't ever have a big plan, and actually the arguments are so close to each other because, you know, in Terry Farron's world, a lot of small things add up to a big thing. That's how you get the London Underground. And in Richard Rogers' world, actually, you know, they do Maggie centres as well as trying to do the Chelsea Barracks redevelopment. And I think your talk, is, for me, is uh, always refreshing, but it's, a, it's just a reminder from the point of view of somebody who, as far as this city is concerned, is both observer uh, and player, which is very, very interesting. It's not given to locals to be those simultaneous things in quite the same way. Um, that the story of architecture and design and the manifestations of it are indications not uh, simply about the formal world of design and planning, but that whole extraordinarily complex hinterland uh, which goes into the creation of any brief 
of any uh, commission for a master plan and ultimately, of course, into the built environment um, that you and your fellow professionals provide us with. Rainy Eddie Brown, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.